to Thompson at back of her? Well, I don't know. In with glasses on. Yes, she is. Look, can you see her now? Look, come get it. I don't like to point. There she is. No, I haven't found it. Oh, yes, I have. I found it. Margaret Thatcher is a woman with a mission, and she believes the ordinary people of Britain will help her to accomplish it. I just said to that police woman, I said, I think it's a dead loss. She can't tell what she's saying. Stand here all day to watch her. Have you been down this end or we sorted at the other end? <laughs> yeah, we, 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 you we were at the top care. end and you've worked your way up. Thank you very much. Margaret Thatcher believes that this election campaign is her one and only chance to become Britain's first woman Prime Minister. Mrs Thatcher's campaign has been made for the media. Her controversial policy and personality, as well as her campaigning methods, have kept her the centre of attraction. Her husband Dennis Thatcher is consigned to a supporting role. No why? Churchill's That's right. It's coming back. Now. It's coming back, isn't it? Coming all through. Mr. Thatcher's role is to chat up those who didn't quite get to talk to the star of the most professionally organised election campaign ever seen in British politics. On the campaign trail, there have been two very distinct Margaret Thatchers. One of them is our Maggie, the housewife's friend. The other is the crusading Iron Maiden, promising a radical brand of free enterprise politics. From the start of the campaign, her Labour opponents have been convinced that Mrs Thatcher is their secret weapon. Mr Callaghan deliberately resisted her call for a quick election campaign, calculating that she would eventually crack under pressure and that Maggie's gaffe would hand them the election. Then they derided her campaign tour as a gimmicky series of non-events. In fact, there's been a sophisticated and careful plan behind every one of Mrs Thatcher's famous photographs. The press say, look, we, want, we don't want just another photograph of you. We were with a hundred uh, bullocks looking in superb condition. There was this beautiful calf. And after all, we had 70 or 80 cameramen round with us. They have to do their job, and I'm very conscious they have to do their job. And they want a good picture. But we learn quite a lot from uh, those farmers. But a lot of people have, mm. have said that the campaign has been full of staged media events? Oh, not at all. Um, I regularly go around the country, go around factories, go around farms, do walkabouts. Wherever I've been on tour, I reckon that it's not good enough for people just to see you on television. They want to see what you're like in three dimensions, not in a flat thing on film. Sometimes it's interesting. Sometimes they say we look very different from television. Sometimes they say the same. But we've always run a campaign, a Meet the People campaign, and I love it. It sometimes seemed that most of the people she has met have been journalists and cameramen, as on the inevitable visit to the silicon chip factory. But there was a serious purpose behind the commotion and the jokes at the heart machine. Come on, that's this is an intensive case. Doesn't patience. look as if it's bitching from that thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still alive, Mum. I hope so. Not only did the Thatchers appear as a warm, loving couple in millions of homes, but she informed us she would be the first ever British Prime Minister with a science degree. That's a pretty steady beat you've got. That's Very right. nice. Yes. Very steady. Oh, yes. Very good. We're all right with us girls. All right. I now prepare us to take a turn to the right, which is very appropriate. How many years at number 10, then? <laughs> I think they'll last me for 20 years. Yes. There we are. So it's coming back again. Does it measure adrenaline No, it doesn't measure adrenaline. It's all right. Perfectly all right. A lung and tongue power. Good. Right. <laughs> Barry Day, a Humphrey Bogart fan and formerly the Conservatives' chief media advisor, has watched how Mrs Thatcher has learnt the professional techniques she's now using in this election. I think she's like any good professional. She just learned the techniques because she realises that they're important to learn. They're part and parcel of a politician's daily life, and I don't think you could say that of many politicians. So, for instance, she's learned how she projects, she's studied her performances, and I wouldn't say that's the wrong use of word. It is a performance one's putting on it to project a particular point of view. Um, she's taken advice on what she's been getting wrong. Her, her appearance has changed, but not dramatically. It's just softened. Um, they've learned from what people say about her. and they've, they've taken some things and others they've ignored. For all her skill with journalists on the election tour, the Conservative lead in the opinion polls has steadily narrowed since the campaign began. 
At her Chelsea home, she summoned shadow cabinet colleagues to discuss tactics. Funny dog, Carrington. What are you up to? I don't know, yes. <laughs> what, what brings you here? The boss. The boss. Uh, coffee, and then with their waters all out. Uh, I just, can I just explain, in case you should think anything different, the people I've got coming have no particular great significance, all those who are not here. They're the ones who are in London this weekend. Angus, hello, in you go. Any particular, I'll bring you all out in a moment, any particular significance in those who are, and particularly those who aren't here. Mrs Thatcher had organised a photo call for her colleagues. Coming out of the bloody zoo. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all have to form a <laughs> Mrs. Thatcher says that by next Friday she will be forming her first cabinet. But she knows that her aggressive brand of conservatism frightens many of her colleagues. And she knows that for all the present show of jollity, if she loses an election campaign that she has so dominated, it will no longer be safe for her to turn her back on them. Everyone concentrated. We've got to start at that end. Now we go over to the centre. And already she's a great deal less popular than her party in the opinion polls. The opinion polls will dash about. They always do. And you have to have an iron nerve, which of course is appropriate for an iron lady. I was a long time as a candidate before I got a seat. Then I got a seat and I became a member of parliament and, glad, and gradually I learned to master that. Then I became a parliamentary secretary and this is really how I know a reasonable amount about pensions because I was in the Ministry of Pensions and I loved it. There are two things in my life. There's all the logical training for years, the steady scientific training with a science degree, the legal training, all the logical training, but still I turn to one's instinct and feel. And you know, sometimes that's best of all. Mrs. Thatcher's election headquarters. The murder of Airy Neve on the first day of the campaign deprived her of her closest political confidant. She's had to rely even more heavily on the experience of Lord Thornycroft, the man she appointed party chairman. Together with other campaign advisers, they decided that she should make very few specific promises and fight on the general issues of tax cuts, prices, and law and order. The man she appointed her publicity director, Gordon Rees, has been described as her Svengali or her Lady Falconer, a flamboyant former television producer with a penchant for large cigars and good champagne. He's credited with changing her image, appearance and her voice. Like her other advisers, he believes that what will decide the election in the crucial marginal seats in the north of England is what they call the Thatcher factor. In other words, how the voters react to the prospect of the first woman Prime Minister, and in particular to that woman being Mrs Margaret Thatcher. Gordon Rees was also responsible for the controversial appointment of a full-time advertising agency, Saatchi and Saatchi, to promote the general Conservative message in the most sophisticated way. Its chairman is Tim Bell. Hello, Mr Bell. Hello. Hello. Can I ask you how the campaign's going? In the advertising world, Mr. Bell's agency is known as a highly creative and aggressive one. To promote the conservative cause, Saatchi and Saatchi decided for the first time to use commercials in the cinema and presented a picture of Britain as one dismal queue after another for everything from jobs to cinema seats. Excuse me, is this a queue bit of 50p stalls? 50p? Haven't you heard of the inflation? I'll tell you what I don't want to see. What's that? Labour in power again. Labour in power? Was that the Marx Brothers? No, another bunch of comedians. <laughs> Coming shortly, The Conservatives. A great programme for all the family. The creative director of Saatchi and Saatchi, responsible for the slogan, Labour isn't working, and for the cinema commercial, is Andrew Rutherford. He's now set up his own agency, but has agreed to talk about his work for the Conservative Party. Like any product, we are given the product, and it's not up to, it wasn't up to us to uh, decide the policies of the Conservative Party. They were given, they were handed to us, and these were the issues, certain issues they wanted to uh, emphasise, and it was just up to us to um, emphasise those issues as effectively as we could. I mean, what 
did they specifically want to emphasize? Well, for example, unemployment, uh, tax, um, this is uh, health and so on. But there have inevitably been accusations that you've been trying to sell the Conservatives like a soap powder in a, in a slick way. I don't know what that means. I, I really don't know what that means. I mean, I, I've heard this and the accusations have come from uh, the Labour Party. I think that they feel sore because they feel we're being effective. On her campaign jet to the crucial marginal seats in the north of England, Mrs. Thatcher maintained her solicitude for the travelling press. It's outrageous. You're pretty crowded here. I'm told it's cold up there. Yes, it is. Mrs. Thatcher's advisers have suggested that in areas of particularly high unemployment, she should modify her normally swinging attacks on state subsidies to ailing industries. Ten people out of work for everyone notified their concern. Working-class Northern housewives who traditionally voted Labour are Mrs. Thatcher's main target. There's a crucially important purpose behind her seemingly gimmicky factory tours and the noisy business of tea tasting. She wants to appear on the early evening television programs as someone who identifies with the problems of ordinary housewives. I'm sorry, it won't make much difference, I trust, whether you're running sound or not. It's oh, it's nice. it's not, of course I'm not going to stand. <laughs> <laughs> That's well, not about nice. Tea, isn't it? No, that's so very nice. Now, which is the next one? Taste, 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 taste that way. All right. Taste that way. Mind you, they'll think I'm drinking. <laughs> That's obviously not a popular one. <laughs> That's why we have a spectrum and we don't like it. All right. <laughs> Who else is going to have a go? Do you buy your tea now in tea banks or in no one? You still have no sip, it's so much more convenient to wash up in tea bags. <laughs> you buy tea bags. It is so much more convenient. And weight for weight, it's quite economical too, isn't it? If you think that you don't put in more than you need because you know. <laughs> Mrs. Thatcher is convinced that television is crucial in this election. When she first became party leader, she hated the prospect of formal studio interviews. But after every appearance, Gordon Rees, the Conservative Publicity Director, commissioned private polls to find out what people thought of her. As a result, her appearance, her manner, and her voice were all modified. We've chosen eight people to represent the election issues we can see to concern Gordon Rees is important to her, I think, because he's a piece of professional reassurance. He's been around and with her for the last ten years, to my certain knowledge. Um, and by this time, he's a personal friend of hers, to a degree. And you listen to friends, because they've got a track record with you. They've been on your side, they've helped you. Other politicians will say, saw you on the box last night, darling, thought you were marvellous. Or probably say quite the opposite, um, when you've gone. A man like Gordon, or whoever happens to be in the mix at the time, um, does anything but that. He's, he's there and he's consistent and she can play off him knowing where he stands and knowing what his values are. How important has the advice of Gordon Rees been in the way you've presented yourself in this campaign? Do you know, I think he's consulted me, not I him. I think it's always been that way round. And it said that Gordon Rees gave you humming lessons to improve the way you Humming spoke. lessons? I'm not a very good hummer. Uh, I just know that when you do get I mean, taught, your voice is, is much lower than, yes, it, than it used um, to be. Well, yes, I'm not quite sure why. Whether it is that one's using it more. But I have often been conscious that at times when I've been very, very, very nervous, your voice rises. It does, you know. And now sometimes I learn to write on the top of a speech. Start low, relax. Don't go too, don't go too slow. Um, and then they said I was going too fast. <laughs> anyway, I just go the speed I like now. <laughs>
Though she is rapturously received by her own supporters, Mrs Thatcher's advisers privately concede that they are worried about the effectiveness of Mr Callaghan's counter-attack on her main campaign plank. He says by cutting income tax, she will raise prices for the poor. Mr Healy and Mr Callaghan, who dare to lecture us about prices, have themselves put prices up by over 100% and food prices by even more than that. So asking you to help us in this, the most crucial election, for putting Britain on a different road, a road going back to increased prosperity, increased prestige, and a Britain of which we can all be proud. In her campaign, Mrs Thatcher has consciously tried to avoid all the mistakes of the man she replaced as Tory leader. She remembers the old adage, oppositions don't win elections, governments lose them. The paradox is that she's so far behind the Prime Minister in the personal popularity polls that the Conservatives could come to power despite rather than because of her. But she knows that if she loses, the Tory knives will be out before you can say Heath. And on the same issues, you know, the tax, prices, law and order, very consistent. Mrs Thatcher feels in her bones that on Friday she'll begin her mission as Britain's first woman Prime Minister. I know that one or two men are prejudiced, but after all, their prejudice is really so, so ridiculous that doesn't deal with it. No argument will deal with prejudice, but some people are prejudiced. I mean, I say to some of them sometimes, my goodness, it's as well you didn't live in the time of Queen Elizabeth I, isn't it? After all, I wonder if we should have grown to such a fantastic nation if we hadn't had people like her. And of course, I mean, look at Golden Mayer in Israel, uh, a woman prime minister during Israel's most difficult years, and she was marvelous. I can put all these arguments, but I know you can never deal with a prejudice by argument. Why did you say that? You will not be given another chance if you lose the election. Oh, there's only one chance in life for women. It is the law of life.